Now this is where the rubber starts to meet the road with the cranial nerves when you start talking about the autonomics and where these fibers are coming from and going because they take uh, circuitous routes. So in these next few slides, I've tried to clarify those and uh, you know map them out for you as best I can, but it's going to take some studying on your part. So in this portion, we're going to talk about three of the ganglia. So uh, I orient these uh, portions based on the uh, ganglion that is uh, being innervated by the preganglionic fibers uh, because that makes most sense to me. There's only five ganglia, uh, really uh, four in the head, and then the uh, vagus nerve has some of its own. So it's easy to organize based on that way. So the first of these ganglia that I'm going to talk about is the otic ganglion. When you think otic ganglion, you should associate that with a parotid gland. Otic ganglion is also innervated by fibers from the inferior, uh, the, uh, the inferior salivary nucleus. The inferior salivary nucleus uh, sends out its fibers through glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, through this circuitous route here, we can see. So uh, first off, on this first slide, we're showing you where inferior salivary nucleus is. It's exiting with glossopharyngeal through jugular foramen. Now we follow that fiber uh, as it... Uh, so here is... This image is not to scale, this drawing. We are at the jugular foramen. Here is glossopharyngeal nerve. Uh, these uh, uh, GVE fibers exit glossopharyngeal nerve just after they leave jugular foramen. Uh, and they form a small little nerve here called the tympanic nerve. Tympanic nerve enters the middle ear uh, via the uh, tympanic canaliculus. At this point, it will uh, these GVE fibers will form a portion of the tympanic plexus which covers the, uh, the inner portion of the tympanic membrane. Uh, they re-enter the cranium as the lesser petrosal nerve and travel along the bottom of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, petrotympanic ridge. That's why they're called the petrosal nerve, in this case the lesser. Uh, so here we can see we've removed the uh, calvarium so we can see, and I've blown up this image, so we can see the uh, hiatus and the groove for the lesser uh, petrosal nerve. And we can see lesser petrosal nerve is going to leave the cranium for the second time, these GVE fibers, via foramen ovale. So they're leaving now in the same place as V3. Uh, these V3 fibers, uh, well, the, these uh, GVE fibers, which are hitching a ride on the V3 fibers, uh, end up synapsing in the otic ganglion. So this is an important concept, this hitching a ride. These GVE fibers in the cranium, they love GSA fibers. Uh, they are going everywhere with them. So wherever the GVEs can join up with a component of trigeminal nerve or some other GSA fiber, they're going to do that. So we've seen that uh, already. <clears throat> So at this point, we've synapsed on the otic ganglion, and that is the complete length of the preganglionic fibers from the inferior uh, salivary nucleus to the synapse, uh, which occurs on the otic ganglion. So now we're going to look at the postganglionic fiber. That postganglionic nucleus is located in uh, the otic ganglion. It sends its postganglionic fiber out of the ganglion and communicates with auriculotemporal nerve, another branch of trigeminal, another GSA branch. Auriculotemporal nerve travels around posteriorly uh, to the uh, mandible and uh, ends up synapsing on the parotid uh, gland. So that is the process by which the parotid gland is parasympathetically innervated. So uh, that's the routes you need to follow throughout all these processes. In these slides, I tried to make it easy on you, but you need to understand where they're exiting the cranium, if they re-enter the cranium, all of these foramen, the name of the nerve that they travel with, or the name of the nerve that they become. Because all of these places give you uh, diagnostic knowledge and allow you to pull apart and differentiate uh, different problems that patients may have. So let's move on and look at now the submandibular uh, ganglion. Submandibular ganglion 
is innervated by fibers from superior salivary nucleus. So inferior salivary nucleus only operates on the otic ganglion. Superior salivary nucleus does a lot of other things. So these fibers uh, travel with facial nerve, cranial nerve 7. Uh, they actually form a separate fiber that's bundled with uh, 7, and that uh, fiber is called nervous intermedius. Uh, they will travel into the internal auditory meatus and continue in the facial canal as the facial nerve. After the genu, <clears throat> so here we are in the facial canal. This is the vertical portion. The horizontal portion is heading that way. So after the genu, these fibers will exit as the corda tympani. Corda tympani is named corda tympani because it's the cord that travels through the tympanic space. It actually travels into the inner ear between the malleus and the incus. <clears throat> it will then uh, re-exit or, uh, you know, fully exit the uh, temporal bone as corda tympani where it joins up with lingual nerve in the infratemporal fossa. From there, corda tympani joins with lingual nerve and it uh, branches off of lingual nerve very briefly to synapse on the submandibular ganglion. That is the extent of the first nerve in this, ch the first neuron in this chain. From there, branches of the postganglionic neuron located in the submandibular ganglion will travel to the uh, sublingual and the submandibular uh, glands. Uh, sometimes these fibers, uh, uh, to go to the uh, lingual gland, will travel along with lingual nerve. They'll rejoin lingual nerve. The branches to submandibular, there are separate uh, little uh, glandular branches uh, that travel there. So uh, that is the extent of uh, the innervation of the GVEs by corda tympani. Now, an important note, remember that corda tympani also has SVAs in it. So it has sensory information. The taste buds from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue in green on this slide are traveling with uh, lingual nerve uh, and traveling uh, with corda tympani. Uh, going back along this same route we just talked about, uh, traveling within the inner ear between the malleus and incus this entire time, which brings up an interesting little anecdote. If, uh, you know, uh, any of you have ever, you know, been at the club and you sat too close to the uh, speakers and that sound uh, is just uh, buffeting your ear and you start to get this weird taste in your mouth, like a metallic taste, and you start to salivate, that's because the incus and malleus is moving so much because of the noise that's being generated that it's uh, activating and stretching this nerve, causing action potentials to reach your brain and to reach the, uh, the glands in your mouth. Uh, so just a uh, fun little anecdote there about being able to taste the bass. Now let's move on and talk about the pterygopalatine ganglion. Pterygopalatine ganglion is innervated by uh, fibers from superior salivary nucleus via facial nerve. Uh, so these, however, take a very different route. They travel uh, into the internal auditory meatus through the horizontal portion, but at the genu, they exit via the hiatus for the facial canal, where they form the greater petrosal nerve. So remember, lesser petrosal nerve, otic ganglion. Greater petrosal nerve is pterygopalatine ganglion. Greater petrosal nerve has now re-entered the cranial cavity. It's running along the floor in the groove of the greater petrosal nerve in the uh, petrotympanic uh, uh, ridge. Here it will uh, re-enter the bone. Um, we'll, I'll show you a picture of this area in greater detail uh, where it forms the pterygoid canal and then synapses on the pterygopalatine ganglion in the pterygopalatine fossa. <clears throat> the postganglionic fiber, so that was the preganglionic, the postganglionic fiber so the uh, nucleus is in the pterygopalatine ganglion. It sends its fibers up uh, and associates with V2. Uh, that V2 heading into the nasal cavity is going to uh, synapse on and innervate the nasal mucosa. So here is uh, that picture 
of the uh, groove for the greater petrosal nerve here, and you can see uh, the greater petrosal nerve, so the lesser petrosal was heading into foramen ovale. Greater petrosal is more medial, and it heads into the pterygoid canal near the carotid canal. So it's heading this way and forming the pterygoid canal uh, very close to, proximal to, the carotid canal. And we can see that process there. So here I'm showing you a more detailed 3D image. So this is um, an inferior view of the uh, skull looking at that carotid canal. Here is the internal uh, view from superior. And now I've taken out and tried to draw a little 3D view of the carotid canal. So here is the, um, the inside of the cranium, the internal carotid artery entering the carotid canal. Here we can see greater petrosal nerve running along the top of the carotid canal. Uh, and it will enter the carotid canal. Within the carotid canal is the uh, pterygoid canal. So some textbooks uh, say that the greater petrosal nerve enters foramen lacerum. It does not. Nothing travels through foramen lacerum. It is completely covered by uh, uh, cartilage and connective tissue. There are no nerves or arteries that travel through it, but this travels on top of it along with uh, some sympathetics that I'm showing here in orange. And those sympathetics join with the uh, nerve of the pterygoid canal along with the greater petrosal nerve to innervate the nasal mucosa. <clears throat> so that's not the end of the pterygopalatine ganglion, however. It has another job. It also innervates the lacrimal gland uh, within the orbit. So these fibers, we're talking about different postganglionic fibers still in the pterygopalatine uh, ganglion. So these uh, nuclei travel up, join with V2. Uh, sometimes they have a communicating branch to get into the orbit and then travel with lacrimal nerve to innervate lacrimal gland. Sometimes they travel retrogradely into the ganglion and then out through V1. Uh, but at any rate, um, they are uh, joining with V2 and V1 to innervate the lacrimal gland. Now I'm showing you those sympathetics I just mentioned that are going to travel with the internal carotid artery. Uh, they form a deep petrosal nerve before joining with greater petrosal, and then they travel through to the nasal mucosa and other regions too. Uh, so these are going to contradict the activity of the parasympathetics that we just talked about. One last little uh, note about clinical relevance and how we use this information diagnostically is related to the facial nerve and where these components are branching from facial nerve along this route. So Bell's palsy is a common form of damage to facial nerve that can result in flaccidity of one side of the face. Uh, so depending on where the lesion to facial nerve occurs, you're going to have different degrees of symptoms. So if the lesion happens at facial nerve, as it enters the internal auditory meatus or as it exits the brainstem, then you're going to have complete loss of all facial nerve components, ipsilaterally, facial paralysis, loss of taste from corda tympani and that nervous intermedius, uh, loss of uh, salivation and lacrimation from the eye uh, because those parasympathetic lacrimal fibers are coming from facial nerve, from superior salivary nucleus via facial nerve and you're gonna have loss of sensation to the ear canal because we know there are GSA fibers of facial uh, nerve that are going to the ear. If the loss happens somewhere inside the uh, vertical portion of the uh, facial canal after the genu, then you're going to get uh, facial paralysis because we're before the stylomastoid foramen. We're going to get loss of taste uh, from corda tympani, which uh, if we're above corda tympani, uh, then we've lost those corda tympani fibers and the salivation uh, that comes from corda tympani. But lacrimation remains because those fibers have branched off with greater petrosal nerve at the genu. If the um, uh, lesion happens peripherally at the stylomastoid foramen, then you're going to have uh, facial paralysis, but taste and salivation will remain as well as lacrimation.
Going to uh, number four here, peripheral damage to just components of the facial nerve in the face, like a, a laceration, then you're just going to have specific partial uh, facial loss. If uh, we have damage to the corda tympani after it branches out of the petrotympanic fissure, then you're going to have only loss of taste and salivation. So this makes sense. Uh, no big deal there. So use this information, use these pathways uh, to diagnose your future patients and to test each other on this information. That's how you're going to get it down. Thanks for watching.